uh, I received uh, earlier this week uh, the Commonwealth's proposed sentencing memorandum, uh, and I also received earlier this week uh, the defendant's um, mitigation report and sentencing, which also makes a sentencing, written sentencing recommendation. I also have, and I expect you've seen uh, the um, guidelines uh, on uh, the two offenses, one and two. Uh, I have Ms. Ritchie's criminal history. And other than that, I have no other written materials anyway that I have reviewed. So as a preliminary matter, are there any other written materials that the parties expected that I have and reviewed? Nothing else on the comment. No, you're right. So uh, we'll proceed first with um, whatever uh, the Commonwealth wishes to do. I can do victim impact statements first, or I can do argument first. Uh, I don't have a firm rule. So however you wish to proceed, Madam Prosecutor. Thank you. Uh, Your Honor, there are a number of uh, victim impact statements. I think it would uh, benefit us all to start with those. Um, as you said, we can. Um, may I just have one moment? Um, I haven't spoken with uh, the Ritchie children yet, but I just want to find out who wants to go first. All right, and then we'll be doing those. I do them from the witness stand. Okay. All right. Thank you. Hello. The day my father died, I was left confused and still am to this day. Seeing my father in a castle really hurt me to see him like that. Without him and my family at the house, it's like a ghost town looking for that time back with them. I can't help to relive memories and get sad because one, they aren't there to enjoy the memory with, and second, I just miss them so much. Times are difficult at home without the people you have there to not be there anymore. It's been getting harder for me to even be at the house and enjoy it let alone live in and call it my home. Especially when the house itself practically left itself. I really didn't express myself back in the day or talk about the problems I had with people normally, but having my family around was what got me through my days. My dad's smart ass humor had really got me through my days and troubles. Through him I learned to try not to take things so serious and or heavy because at least for the time, for this time I've had without my family, it only gets worse unless you make it better. I've had to go through a lot of changes to be where I am I am now today in life. Some good, some bad, but all just taught me to go through it. Worst part about it is that it felt like no one was there to help through all this before or after, even though there were and probably were more people. But I can't blame them because they are probably just going through the same in their own way. Throughout the years, my mom as a woman did try her best to do her role as a mom while dealing with life itself. She tried being there for those who tried being there for her. She loves her family and friends very deeply, and to me, seems seems the reason why things led to how we sit today. From what I've seen, she loved my father deeply, <clears throat> which kind of explains the constant fights and such about the affair. I miss my father every day alongside with pops and moms. They are the ones who raised me, made and brought me to the world that we are here in today. My father, even though he was hurting, he still had a big heart. Even though he was a big drinker up to his sobriety, he still tried to enjoy time with us and bring us to places where some dads with the same struggle don't bring their kids at all and or can't. Him being a firefighter and veteran brought some cool and good relationships to our lives. But every, but every family has their problems and obviously my family did as well. I think that drinking helped him with coping with life before he found another way to help him things through sobriety. For my mom and father at the same time, I can't thank them enough for meeting each other and sticking it out through the thick and thin, trying to fix things for themselves and their family. I try not to stress out my mom or the man, my father, Michael Senior, even though I stress out my mommy and the man. I can't say enough how much I love them and it hurts not being able to see them together again like back at home. 
my father and mom had some really good times together, and that's just from me seeing and being there. The, the only other times we're go, the only other the only other things were going left is when I would say she would be concerned about his drinking or whereabouts. They both struggled, and sometimes I don't think they realized it would affect us or not. From my view, everyday people were hurt, even if it was a little bit, but there was still worry, pain, and tiredness from the fights. To a point, everybody was trying to leave. I don't want my mom robbing away in prison. In fact, I don't want her sitting in there at all because that's my mom. But she did take my person who I called my father slash dad for all, for, all my, for all my life away from me. To be honest, I couldn't even give you a proper sentencing number because it hurts so much not having either of them. So I asked and then it's not for her to sit there for life. I'd like to see her out in the world again one day, hopefully the same person but a recovered one. But I, what I really would like for her to get is to do something with her life instead of prison for life. I would ask for the minimum sense because she's a good person that struggles but tries to do better than and know or fix the problems everyone had. After all, when I was little she had to help us when we messed up and all is that I can uh, all is that I can hope to be there. When or if she gets out. Growing up, I thought I'd be the first one sentenced and it hurt to see my mom going through this on top of everything else, including losing her husband slash my father. I love my family, I love my mom, and I love my dad. Thank you. Uh, I just want to start off by saying uh, thank you to the court, the jurors, and to you, Your Honor, for uh, discovering the truth of my father's passing. I'm eternally grateful and appreciative for everyone's involvement in the final truth and oh, for allowing the truth to have its day. Uh, I've been trying to write this impact statement over the last couple days, and I've written about five different variations of it, each one longer than the last, but no words on a page can surmise or even begin to describe the amount of anger pain, confusion, and hurt that I've been carrying with me since my father's death. This whole situation has sucked. I never thought to imagine that I would have to be testifying on behalf of my father's death, and at the other end of it would be the person I used to call my mom. As I mentioned in my testimony, my dad was my, and is my, still my hero. He's perhaps the most important person in my life. He's the person I looked up to and tried to live my life the way he did. He's an army veteran, so I wanted to join the military because of him. And as a kid, I would spend the nights with him at the firehouse, so naturally I wanted to join the Boston Fire Department. He was that constant example for me to live my life selflessly, putting others before myself, and to be that helping hand for anyone, and to enjoy the time that I had left, and to make the most of it. But we also had a very personal relationship as a father and son. We would stay up late together watching TV shows from his childhood, listen to music and go to concerts together, and he would tell me stories from when he was a kid into his adulthood life advice that he would tell me to prepare me going into the real world. He was that guy I could always trust and always count on with my life, if life was taking me to the ground. I never thought that having such a special relationship with him meant that I now have to live in a world without him. Having to retell this experience I, that I went through, the open wounds of pain and anguish over the course of three years since my dad was gone, it's been tough. Reliving that night he died, that I was the first family member at the hospital, that was the first person to know that he died. I can still feel to this day the emotions that I was going through when, I was at, when the hospital staff told me. I couldn't believe what they said. I was just in complete shock. It really felt like someone tore open my heart and there was an emptiness in my body that just made me feel numb. But I knew I had to break the news to everybody else, which I did through disbelief. And I immediately from that point on had to undertake the responsibility for what was to come. I had to plan out his wake and funeral. I had to decide where he was to be buried, what clothes he would, would be wearing, the casket he would be put to rest in, what was going to be written on his gravestone. I was even with him transporting his body back from Boston Medical to Marshfield with the help of the Boston Fire Department. All the while communicating with DCF to decide where my sister will live and who was to be taking care of her. And I'm thinking to myself, no kid should have to go through anything like this. I'm angry that my fear, the nightmare that would keep me up at two in the morning, 
is the reality I now have to live through of what could have happened if I wasn't there the day I left in 2019. Living through all this, understanding what I was doing and how personal every decision I made gave me a realization, a different kind of pain, a different kind of hurt that anyone else, that no one else a different kind of pain, a different kind of hurt than anyone else, than anyone else that I am both honored and heartbroken to be carrying with me. However, that feeling of having to go through all that wasn't the difficult part. It was how I saw everyone else that made me feel horrible. The amount of people I saw completely broken, faces covered in tears and sorrow, an endless amount of support who I saw all hurting, friends and family suffering and grief and anger. And that I hugged and consoled, all looking at me as a source of strength, the guy who held back his emotions to fight through this horrific storm. As a man, I was honored, and it was a privilege to be taking on such a heavy burden in the name of my father. But as a kid who just lost his dad, his best friend, I never felt more lost in that world. Watching everyone grieving, looking to me for guidance, for hope, and I wasn't able to show my grief at my own father's funeral. Three years later, I have been able to understand and live with grief, but I can't say it's gotten any easier as the time went on. I can't watch the movies without thinking about the story it reminds him of. I can't listen to certain songs without skipping the song entirely because of the song he played when he was cooking dinner. And I can't go to concerts without having to get in my car crying, you should be there with me. I have to come to terms that the last time I'll ever hear my dad say I love you and I'm proud of you, will be in my head from when I saw him a week before he died. What hurts me the most is that my sister got her childhood robbed from her. The innocence, that her innocence isn't a privilege anymore that she gets to live through. She now has to live with not having one last hug from him, that he wasn't there to see her graduate high school, that he won't be able to walk with her down the aisle on her wedding day, that she won't have the feeling of being daddy's little princess anymore. That hurts me more than anything else. And it it's me that at 17 years old, she has to call 911 about the, her father lying on response in front of her. And she now has to live with that the entire life to haunt her. I carry with me a sense of guilt every day that I didn't do all I could as an older brother to never have her anywhere close to that kind of situation. I run so many scenarios in my head of what I could have done to prevent her from being in that position but I feel like I failed her and I failed myself because of it. I want to emphasize that I don't hate the person I called my mom. I will always love her, but the person who took my father's life showed me she wasn't there. I had to come to terms with that she's gone and that person she's now is someone else I had to separate, I had, I had to separate myself from in order to live my own life. It broke my heart to me both, that both my parents are now gone I don't know if I can forgive Christine. She took one of the most important people in my life, but I know that God and my dad want to want revenge in my heart. I pray that she creates a relationship with Jesus Christ and to better herself and to take accountability for what she did so we can all heal. We have years of healing that we have to do so I'm going to find a sense of normalcy and become a family again. It's going to take a lot of time, a lot of tears and perseverance but we have to do it alone between me and my siblings. So to you, Your Honor, after hearing us speak today, hearing everyone's testimony during trial, and your thoughts on the case as a whole, only God can decide what is a fair and just punishment. But I know that you will reflect on what is a fair and just punishment as well. I want to thank everyone again for the due diligence and for allowing me to speak today. Nothing will ever bring back my father. He lives with us, but he lives with us in our hearts. I know that my father, as well as other people, will cherish to know that we will not fall victim to this, to our past, but, we'll live, but we will live as survivors together as a family. Thank you.
Your Honor, I'm not sure what the right words are or where to even begin when talking about this, but I guess I will start with what it was like to lose my dad. Losing my dad was what, if not the hardest, if, if not the hardest, one of the hardest and most painful things I'll, I think I'll ever experience. Having to face the fact I will never get the chance to have a simple conversation with my dad, down to him not being there at my graduation or any other milestones I would meet was heartbreaking. Having to look past the endless rides we would go on, sending these favorite songs from when he was a kid and all the small beloved memories I had I have to think about every day to try and get anything close to the feeling I felt being with my dad is impossible. What made things harder than anyone could imagine was having to accept that the person who I wanted to confide in the most and who I wanted to make everything better was the person everyone was holding accountable for my pain. I felt bad missing my mom because I knew what she had done was bad and I knew there was no way I would or could minimize the harmful emotion, charge, action she took and the decision she made that night. It made me angry with her for a while because again, I wanted her to comfort and she was the reason I couldn't have that. However, again, I just want to take this moment to reiterate that in no way do I think what my mom did was anywhere near okay. In fact, again, it was the most worst experience I've ever been through. Regardless though, I do know that my mom and my dad had had and have so much love for me and my siblings, and I know they had a, a mountainless love for each other. No one, else, no one saw them every day like I did, and I don't blame anyone for that. But the only thing I can do is miss my dad and miss my mom until I get the opportunity to hopefully see them again. I'll never, I'll never forget the severity of my mom's actions, but I will forgive her because she's my mom and I'll always love her as she has me. Most importantly, I will never forget my dad, who did everything he did for his family and friends. So as, I'm, so as I near the end of this statement, all I can truly say is, I just want my family back together, as much as I can have, and I want more than anything for us to heal together. So Your Honor, I ask you with every inch of my heart for you to keep my mother's relationship with the kids and the endless love she has shown us in your mind as you make a decision on her sentencing. Thank you. Excuse me. Um, we would next call Mr. and Mrs. Ritchie. Yes, you can come right up here. my husband and I the opportunity to voice our sadness, the sadness our family has suffered since the loss of our son, Michael Ritchie. The defendant, Christine, has been guilty of taking our son away from his family and friends long before she stabbed him in the night. Our family has lost so many wonderful family events, gatherings, Without our son Michael, our grandchildren have lost so many wonderful, special moments without their dad, all, all due to the defendant's manipulation, alienation, and control. She was so possessive over our son Michael, the defendant took away his voice, his wonderful life. We wish we could have asked him to take away the Richie name, last name from her, as she does not deserve the honor. However, we, 
we cannot. We ask that you impose the maximum of 25 years on this second degree murder charge and the maximum sentence on the assault and battery with the dangerous weapon to be served after the sentence for the murder is for the murder is complete. I'm sorry. Um, we feel she does not deserve any less. She took our son's life. She took our children's brother. She took our grandchildren's father away from them, and on and on. Why, she, why should she have freedom? He did not. He took such. He, she took such a great man with a warm heart for so, so many beautiful people. <laughs> Thank you so much for letting me express this to you. And I'm, I'm done. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Rona. Thank you very much. Uh, Your Honor, with the court's permission, um, I will be reading the next impact statement um, by uh, Donna Ritchie Lavalli. Uh, Lavalli. And uh, Donna is um, Michael Ritchie Jr.'s sister, one of his many siblings. Um, and this is her words. Uh, I understand the point of a victim impact statement, but I don't understand quite how to convey the impact. I lost my brother Michael at the hands of his wife. He is no longer here to live a life he so deserves to live. No one has the right to take that away from anyone. She not only took his life, but tortured him and their children with no regard for anyone but herself. Michael was a kind, sweet man, a hardworking, responsible man, a loving and caring man. He never would have left his children in harm's way, which is why he didn't leave. He feared for his children's safety. Michael was two years younger than me. Me, my brother Billy, and Michael used to hang out a lot when growing up. Even as young adults, we'd go to the same friends' gatherings together. We were very, very close. In fact, he's the godfather to my daughter, Jessica. We laughed a lot. My brothers always watched out for me. Michael, being my little brother, still made sure I was always okay. The loss of my brother is heart-wrenching. My poor parents have been suffering through pretrial hearings, a lot of which the jury was unable to hear. But my parents did, sitting in the courtroom, time after time, torture after torture. Me and my brothers and sisters did. Billy, mostly in court. Diana, Paul, Anthony, and myself on Zoom. We had to appoint a family contact person to communicate all pretrial information, dates, and Zoom sign-in information. We as a family had to do something that she caused. No family should ever have to adjust their lives because a person decides they can take someone else's life taking days off work, having to disclose personal family information to our bosses and coworkers as to why we need to Zoom a murder trial. Her sick torture continued through the rest of my family even after she took Michael from us. On Friday, August 2nd, 2024, her control and torture to our family ended with the rightful verdict of guilty. We, the Ritchie family, can begin to heal. I respectfully ask your honor to impose the maximum sentencing allowed with the said verdict and show no leniency as she did not to my brother and their children. I hope she never sees freedom in her lifetime. And uh, next we have Diana Ritchie. And I think I might be reading her statement as well. And she had also put together a, um, a little collage of pictures that she wanted your honor to take a look at. Diane 
Ritchie, Your Honor, is another sister of Michael Ritchie Jr. She, all of these people are in the courtroom, but um, some of them do not feel very comfortable reading uh, the statement. So with, again, with Your Honor's permission, if I could read her statement to the court. Just one minute, I want to take yes, it. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Of course, I'll Thank you. allow you to read it. Your Honor, it's extremely difficult to put into words exactly how my brother's murder has impacted me, so I will go with what I do know. I do know that since the day I met the defendant, she was controlling, vindictive, hateful, and cruel. She viewed my brother as an object and not as the sensitive, loving person he was. The defendant's goals were to control him, and she ultimately did until he started to break away from her evil grips, but by that time it was unfortunately too late. The defendant took away a beautiful life. Michael was a selfless man whose livelihood was saving other people's lives. Taking my brother's life was not her right to do. <clears throat> Abusing my brother was not her right, nor was tormenting him, not for any reason. From day one, I could never understand just who the defendant thought she was and what gave her that right. But this is no longer the defendant's call. Her fate lies in one place and one place only, and that is in the hands of our honorable judge. Her honor will determine the fate of the defendant. That is why I am here to ask that her honor impose the maximum sentence on the defendant for the gross murder of my brother Michael. Because the thought of the defendant ever walking the streets as a free person sends fear and chills down my spine. The defendant is an extremely dangerous and sick individual who is a threat to society, period. Thank you for your time listening. I love you, brother. We miss you terribly. And that's Diana Ritchie. And um, the next thing will be Paul Ritchie, and he'll be um, reading his statement. This is the view from up here, okay, interesting. Thank you for allowing us to speak. Obviously, I'll just introduce myself up. It's Michael Sr. We're all the siblings of, of, of Michael Sr. Uh, he is my brother. I, I, I don't want to use was. Uh, as we said, we are seeking the maximum penalty uh, for the fact that he was killed, and the murderer was convicted. Obviously, I don't have to tell you that, but I just... So, since, since um, that evening, uh, that, that horrible night that uh, he was killed, uh, you know, that uh, the whole family, pretty much a piece of us, you know, died, died with him. I, I have a lot of concern about my parents as well. Uh, you know, they say, you know, when a parent has to lose their son or daughter, it's, it's just the most, uh, how, you know, the worst thing in the world. I'm not a parent, so I don't have, I don't know that. But, but to have the child taken by murder, it's just, it, it just must be gut-wrenching. Well, I know it's gut-wrenching to my parents. I could just tell three years this is what we've been living with. My mother and father have been nothing but, but um, crying for these past three years. It's like, uh, like we'll never be at peace as a family. Um, it's hard to be a whole family again anyway. Uh, for example, you know, Thanksgiving, Christmas, uh, family gatherings, they'll never be the same. They always sort of an empty chair, you know. However, knowing that justice was served and knowing that Michael's murderer will be in prison is somewhat of a consolation. My thoughts and prayers, of course, are obviously with my family, her children. Of course, there's no, there's no doubt that everybody lost, everybody lost. No one 
Every, everybody lost. I'd also like to point out that, you know, people are able to have visitors in prison, but uh, and to visit Michael, we have to go look at, go to dirt and look at his gravestone. I, I, you know, think about that, or at least that's how I'm looking at it, how I feel. If I was confident, and you know, I, I, I don't want to talk bad, but if I was confident that, that she had, or she is capable of showing remorse, I would tend to say, please be lenient. But I think just uh, the family knows, as a, as a family, we know that it, it's not something that the accused is able to, to do. And I think that a reality check behind bars might show, you know, uh, that she, maybe she could uh, obtain accountability at that point uh, for, for the murder. Time behind in, in prison. I never want to see anybody go through this. What I had to see with my siblings, with my parents, it's just I don't I don't wish that on anybody. I will obviously uh, be praying for 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 the kids and and and. and even the accused. But it's just the fact that the, the, the hurt that has just been going on in our family, it's just, it's a lot. So the reason I will pray, I will mention that, of course, my parents raised, our parents raised us with Christian values. Of course, Michael, she raised with Christian, they raised with Christian values. Donna, Diana, Billy, Anthony, and myself. All Michael's siblings, of course. I know you know this, but um, I thank you. It's very important that I get to address address the court so that the accused can hear how she tore our hearts and consequently put a knife in one of them. So um, if I reflect on that night, I, I just would like some closure for my parents and my siblings. And I believe the court can make this happen. I, I do thank Your Honor. I do thank the gentleman Baylor for their assistance. I do thank the Commonwealth for all that they've done to make us comfortable. I have a little bit of an issue with hearing, so it's been very good. So, that being said, if I never hear the word sidebar or objection again, it will be too soon. God be with you all. Thank you for listening. Thank you. There's one last one, Your Honor, and that's uh, William Ritchie, another sibling. Your Honorable Judge, as I wrote this impact statement, I thought to myself, is this what has become of my brother's life? 52 years later, I would be sitting in a courtroom giving a statement at his murder trial. I thought to myself, how tragic. I can recall growing up with my brother Michael, which were some of the best times in my life. We laughed a lot, we cried a lot, we shared a lot of memories together. I remember when he joined the army, we had a going away party for him with family and friends. We were so proud of him. When he came home, he decided to take the police and fire exam. I remember the day he received the acceptance letter in the mail from the Boston Fire Department. 
I remember hugging him. And I remember him telling me, I'm going to wait for the police acceptance letter. And I said to him, Michael, no you're not. You don't have the personality to be a police officer. You're a firefighter. Then Michael met the defendant. When Michael, met the defend when Michael married the defendant, it was apparent to my family right away that there was something wrong with you. As the years went on, we learned you poisoned the minds of relatives and your own children with lies, manipulating them into thinking we were an evil family. And for 15 years, you isolated Michael from his mother, his father, along with his siblings. We missed birthdays, holidays, special occasions with my brother and his children. We would later find out at Michael's funeral that you went even as far as isolating him from your own father and sisters for three years before murdering my brother. Because of your one narcissistic, selfish act of violence, you have caused so much pain and heart to a lot of people. However, I believe only good will come out of this. The Bible says what Satan intended for evil, God intended for good. When I thought all hope was gone and I would never see my brother again, I received a text message from Michael in June of 2019 stating, Hey, Billy. <clears throat> this is my new number, brother. Love you. I remember being so excited and replying within seconds. Awesome. Let's get together soon. During the next couple of years, I would share some special moments with my brother. I attended some AA meetings, some AA softball games, a couple of cookouts in the backyard, and a card game at my house. Last time I would see my brother in person would be on November 13th, 2020. I remember walking him out to my driveway and saying, promise me we will go out for coffee and talk. Little did I know those words would be the last words I would say to my brother. I would receive a final text on January 17th, 2021 from my brother Michael that read, hey brother, just checking in to say hi and love you. Happy belated birthday also. <clears throat> I replied, I love you too. Happy belated birthday to you as well. Let's get together soon. On January 28th, 2021, I would see my brother for the last time watching the news with the headline saying, 23 year old veteran of the Boston Fire Department was murdered in his Marshfield home. We were in utter shock and dismay. Our family did not expect to wake up that morning and have our loved one taken away from us so su suddenly and in such a horrific way. They say a man's castle is his home. Unfortunately, because of your abuse and control, my brother was a prisoner in his own home. Defendant, prison will now be your home. And like my brother, you will be a prisoner in your own home. I would like to share with you a quote from a picture frame that hung in your bedroom above your bed. For I know the plans I have for you to give you a hope in a future, Jeremiah 29, 11. It's only by the grace of God that I have to learn to forgive you for what you've done to my brother Michael. I believe Michael put his faith and trust in Jesus Christ and my hope is I will see him in heaven someday. Over these last three and a half years, and during the trial, it was apparent to us that you have shown no remorse, nor taken any accountability for murdering Michael, confirming what we have always believed about you, that there was something wrong with you. I pray you would repent and ask for forgiveness, not only for violently taking the life of our loved one, but also destroying the lives of your own children. Shame on you. Michael, Angel, Sophia, I am so sorry for all the physical and verbal abuse you suffered at the hand of the defendant. I am so sorry that the defendant became so selfishly enraged 
murdering your father and taking your hero away. Everyone in that home saved the defendant's life when she attempted suicide. And then she turned around and took the life of the very person who saved her. My family and I will never understand why such an abusive, violent person like you was allowed to continue to live in that home and eventually murder my loved one. My brother was a gentle soul, loving, kind, self-sacrificing hero who loved life. There was nothing my brother neither did nor could have done for you that gave you the right to murder him and take his life from us. There isn't a minute that doesn't go by that I don't think about my brother Michael. And as long as I'm alive, this impact statement will not be the end of my brother's story. I will speak the truth in love, and Michael's story will be told. The Bible says God is a merciful God, but he is also a just God. The voice of my brother's blood has cried out to God from the ground. The jury has spoken, wherein the defendant was charged in the crime of murder in the second degree, the defendant was found guilty. I ask Your Honor for the strictest penalty. Wherein the defendant was charged in the crime of assault in a battery with a deadly weapon, the defendant was found guilty. I ask Your Honor for the strictest penalty. There is only one hope for the defendant now. That is Jesus Christ. May God have mercy on your soul. Thank you.